We are. We are. We are cultivate. 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 We are cultivate. Hello and welcome to Yield Crime, where we discuss the funny, strange, and obscure crimes of yesteryear. I am your host, Lindsay Valenti, and with me is my sister and co-host, Maddie Stengel. Hello. Hi. How's it going? It's going. It's been kind of a hot second. It has. Well, like, for this. Not yeah. necessarily, like, we've done guest spots together but yeah yeah we had a bit of a break it was kind of weird yeah it was kind of sad i missed you i missed you too but it's okay we're back now <laughs> yeah we're back <laughs> so this is episode 97 that's bananas right i was like it's gonna be 100 before we know it day and on that note, we need listener questions. So, mm-hmm. if you have burning questions you want to ask us, or just something random and funny and weird you want to ask us, please send them our way. Absolutely. I'll put a request out on social as well, but don't be afraid to just email them or tweet them at us or mm-hmm. put them on the, the Instagram and the Facebooks. You know where we are. The RPR. Anyway, today we are going to France. Ooh, okay. Because I like to torture myself <laughs> with French. <laughs> <laughs> that and like a lot of terrible things happened in France. Oh yeah, so many like, bad things happened. In France. So many bad things. Y'all needed that the chocolate and the French bread just to survive. <laughs> Croissants and baguettes. You needed it. All right. We are going to be discussing Madame Dubron Villiers. Okay. Information was pulled from the following sources. The 2018 Bonjour Paris blog post by Marilyn Brower. 2018 History Collection article by Natasha Sheldon. 2015 Mental Floss article by Miss Selenia. 2010 Executed Today article by Headsman, not his real name, I'm assuming. <laughs> a 1910 book by Alexandre Dumas, Pierre, um, on Project Gutenberg, Genie.com, and Murderpedia. Nice. And links to all of these articles will be included in the show notes. Prepare yourself for all the French. So much French. So much French. Marie Madeleine Marguerite Dubré was born July 22nd, 1630, in Paris to Antoine Dru Dubré and Marie Ollier. Her father, Antoine, was a civil lieutenant of Paris, and her grandfather Ooh. had been the treasurer of France. Nice. So she was, her family's highfalutin. Yeah. So through marriage, the Dubrays were related to some of the most influential families in France. Yeah, that leads to murder and intrigue pretty fast. So she's kind of a big deal. She's kind of a big deal. Marie was one of four children. Because there was no real birth year for her siblings, some of the dates ranged from, like, we were born between 1605 and 1661. That's a huge gap. <laughs> right? I feel bad for her mom. So I'm just going to say that she was... 60 this... years of baby making? Right. How did she not, that doesn't expo- make... <laughs> How did she not die? <laughs> it makes zero sense. Uh... She was the sister of Antoine Jr., so Antoine II, mm-hmm. Francois, and Therese. That's a good name. I think she fell in after Francois... And before Therese, but I okay. am not sure. 
Okay. I couldn't find out, obviously, because of the lack of birth dates, Mm -hmm. where she fell in the pecking order. All I know is, I think she's got at least one older brother. I don't know. I'm sure someone out there is like, this is the order. I couldn't find it. Yeah, send it in. Send it in if you know. Knowledge is power. Marie's family was wealthy, aristocratic, and well-known, given her father's profession. And Marie was described as quite pretty with, quote, an endearing air of childlike innocence, end quote. Ew. I just don't like that. Yeah, keep that sentiment in mind, because according to Marilyn over at Bonjour Paris, this description contradicts reports that she had been sexually abused when she was seven and entered into, I'm assuming against her will, an incestuous relationship with one of her brothers when she was 10. Yeah. Whenever whenever somebody's like, oh, she's so cute and innocent and young, it's like, that's... Those together are very predatory sounding. Mm -hmm. It'd be different if you were like, yeah, here's my adorable two-year-old. Yep. That's all you need to say. Yep. You don't need to fetishize anything about them. Yeah. At the age of 21 in 1651, Marie married Mm -hmm. Antoine Gobelin du Bronvilliers, who was the Marquis... Du Bronvilliers. Okay. Antoine was a commanding officer of a regiment and had an income of 30,000 lira a year. I didn't do any Dang. calculations. I'm just going to go based off of these numbers because they're already kind of impressive. Yeah, 30,000 a year. Hold on. When was it? 1600s? 1651. It's hard to convert lira. So the fl- inflation rate is 33.33. Okay. Yeah, it was almost 100,000, maybe. I don't know. My math is always wrong. <laughs> <laughs> My math is not so great. An impressive amount of money, yeah. as well as a lump sum that he'd received from his father some five years prior to his marriage to Marie. Okay. Marie had entered into their union with a considerable dowry. I bet. 150,000 liras, not to mention a personal fortune of 50,000 liras. Yeah, she was rolling in the money. So he was marrying up, if anything. Yeah, which is interesting, because normally it's the other way around. Yeah. Although outwardly the pair seemed to be quite wealthy, it wasn't long before Marie became aware that Antoine had a gambling problem. There it is. And soon he was in a substantial amount of debt. Great. Like the, I'm going to take your fingers type of debt? Yeah. Dang. So, as I mentioned previously, there are no specific dates that I could find. But the pair did have children together. Okay. <laughs> did she have children until she was in her 70s, like her mom? No. Oh, okay. Thank God. <laughs> Antoine Gobelin du Bronvilliers II and Drew Gobelin du Bronvilliers. I hate French names. <laughs> I literally could only find their names and nothing more. And based off something that happens later on in the story, I'm assuming one of them passed away in infancy. Probably. I mean, odds are pretty high just during the time. Yeah. Males tend to be more susceptible to illness early in life. Yeah. And these were both boys. So yeah. take that as you will. The Dubron Villiers took part in an open marriage. Ha <laughs> They were pineapple people. (laughs) Yeah. Nice. And both regularly had a number of affairs until Marie made the acquaintance of Jean-Baptiste Godin du Santa Croix. He sounds highfalutin. (laughs) Willie. (laughs) Willie just spelled. He did. Oh, at least it wasn't super liquidy. He had one yesterday where I, like, was concerned. So she made his acquaintance in 1659 at the age of 29. 
Jean-Baptiste was a gambling friend of her husband's that he had met while in the army. Uh, and by all accounts, they were close in age. So, uh -huh. again, I couldn't figure out how old her husband was. I have no idea how old Jean-Baptiste is. I feel like that's okay. Because yeah. of how dated it is in the 1600s, yeah. early 1700s, there was very little consistent record keeping, especially if you were a woman. So, yeah, even if you were a highfalutin woman. So, well, and these are men. So it's like I was surprised that I couldn't find any information about them. But to be fair, they weren't like super high up men, especially if they were, I don't know. Yeah. I don't want to It judge. makes you wonder if there was like a power play in the fact that they don't keep records for certain people. That Probably. Are you know, like, we don't want to remember you. People don't need to know when you were born and when you died because no one cares. And that your wife had, had children when she was 70. It's fine. <laughs> it's fine. Bye-bye. Once she started her affair with Jean Baptiste, who didn't have a noble background or much to his name at all, besides a bad reputation and debt, Cute. Marie didn't even bother to hide it. Yeah, I, I mean, well, and I feel like there's there's this really prevalent history of like royals doing what they want and going against norms mm -hmm. in that way. So I could see. I mean, it's it's the housewives of of France. Yeah, <laughs> the real housewives of France. The real housewives of Paris. She soon separated from her husband, although on paper they were still legally married. She would lavish Jean Baptiste with gifts to pay for their extravagant tastes, which she mm -hmm. continued to indulge in even after her husband Antoine had to flee France to escape the creditors that were after him. Yeah. Call that out from a mile away. Yeah. We saw that one coming. Yep. That doesn't mean that everything was hunky-dory after her husband fled the country. Marie's father was pretty peeved about the scandal she was causing. So he went ahead and got himself a letter of seal, signed by the king and the secretary of state, so that he could throw Jean-Baptiste in prison at the Bastille, where he Whoa. stayed for six weeks starting in May 1663. Dang. Yeah. If that wasn't a, a fuck you move, I don't know what yeah. is. That was a stop touching my daughter move for sure. Yeah. While Dang. he was imprisoned, Jean-Baptiste shared a cell with an Italian man named Exili, who just happened to know a thing or two about poisons as a skilled assassin under the employ of Queen Christina of Sweden. Stop. Oh, it gets better. While incarcerated, Exili taught Jean-Baptiste everything he knew about a poison that we've discussed in the past. Aqua Tofana. Stop it. That's... Amazing. So she was a part of this yep. story. This yep. is the real housewives of, of Paris. Yep. She's like, let me let me tell you. <laughs> yep. Exili also provided Jean Baptiste with the name of a master chemist, Christophe Glazer, who owned and operated a shop in the Jardin Royal du Plantes. Following his release from prison. Jean-Baptiste seemed to reform. He purchased a home, mm -hmm. got married, and started work as an alchemist and a scholar. That didn't mean that he stopped seeing Marie. Uh-huh. Yep. If they, were, if they were super into each other, it wasn't going to end anytime soon. Mm -mm. Sorry, to, especially, especially if her dad doesn't want her doing it. Yep. In fact, she would often join him in his laboratory, learning <sighs> alongside him the craft of poison from Christoph Glazer. Not the laboratory. The laboratory. Was it Dexter's laboratory? <laughs> no, it was uh, Jean-Baptiste's laboratory. <laughs> so weird. Glazer was well known in aristocratic circles for his quote-unquote Glazer's receipt. 
for impatient heirs eager for an early inheritance. Dang. Yeah, this is some privileged stuff. Yeah. It's it's unsettling. Yeah. With Jean-Baptiste's know-how and Marie's connections, it seemed like the pair were going to embark on a very profitable business venture. Mm -hmm. Jean-Baptiste, however, was encouraging Marie to get her affairs in order to protect them from her wayward husband. And it was as these discussions were being had that a plot was hatched to increase the pair's fortunes. Mm -hmm. Marie soon got to work experimenting on different dosages and strengths of the key ingredients for the poison, arsenic and mercury. Yeah. Oh, oh God. Can you imagine dying of mercury poisoning Ugh. with just a dash of arsenic? With just you a know, dash. Just to help, help break it all down. Just a splash. Ugh, awful. Awful. Marie's test subjects were her own maid, Francois Roussel. Stop. She didn't kill her, but she did poison her pretty good. That's awful. You think that's bad? She also tested the sick in the nearby Hotel du Deu, which is the oldest hospital in Paris. Of course she did. Of course she did, because they were already dying, so she didn't care. Yep. Fun Ooh, fact. Wow. It also holds the distinction of being the oldest hospital in the world that is still running, having opened in 829 AD. I can't even... Like, did they have a ribbon cutting? <laughs> <laughs> It was like a hut. Obviously, it has been improved upon since it first I really, opened. <laughs> I really hope so. I would hope so. Oh, my God. It's just a bunch of stone. It's like the same hut. <laughs> and they're like, just die here. It's fine. <laughs> Let's escort you to the back where the death pit is. Yeah, it's just, it's just the old death pit. It's fine. Stop complaining. Once she'd seemingly gotten the correct dosage amounts nailed down, Marie went into action. Her father was going to spend a holiday at his castle, the Ouf Emon. The Ouf? The Ouf Emon. <laughs> Dad's just at the Ouf, it's fine. <laughs> Dad's I'm going gonna... to the Ouf. He's going to the Ouf. Let's murder. <laughs> Knowing this, Marie offered to join him. Oh, she's going to murder at the oof? At the oof. Oh, shit. Thinking that she had written him off entirely after he ha he'd had her lover thrown into prison. Uh-huh. Antoine was overjoyed to learn that his daughter did, at least in his mind, still hold some affection for her father. And he gladly accepted her invitation. Sure. Yep. Lots of love. Based on the location of the castle which lay in the middle of the Forest of Egg, about three or four miles outside of Copien, it was readily apparent that any sort of medical help would take some time, should it be needed, of course. I mean, the hut is so far away. At the this hut point. is so far. It's so far. Yeah. No amount of ribbon can connect you to them <laughs> to drag your body to them. <laughs> Antoine and his daughter <laughs> went to the castle with just one of his servants. All was well for a time, and Marie mm. ensured that she alone should be in charge of her father's care. Sure. Because she does love him. She loves him much. so much. So much love. Wow. With this settled, of course he had no reason to be suspicious of the soup uh. she prepared for him one night, which he eagerly drank. It was shortly after this that he began to fall ill and call out for his daughter's help. Which I'm sure she just ran right, right to him. Yep. Into his arms. Marie played the part of the doting daughter during the course of his sudden illness. For eight months, she lived Stop. with him. Stop. She slowly poisoned him for eight months. Slowly poisoning him to death. Holy shit. That is, that is a horrifying long game. That is yeah. beyond 
that is beyond sociopathic. Like, yep. oh my God. When her father died in September of 1666, after receiving 27 doses of poison, the ruse had worked so beautifully that his cause of death was noted as natural, so no autopsy was performed. Of course. He just had a long illness for eight yep. months. Yep. My God. There was a snag in Marie's plan, however. Wait, what? She would have to split the inheritance with her two brothers and her sister. Uh-oh. She doesn't like sharing. She doesn't. Upon her father's death, her share wasn't nearly as much as she had originally hoped, as the bulk of it went to her eldest brother, then her other brother, before she and her sister. Yeah. Yeah, welcome welcome to the 1600s, 1700s, my, my girl. <laughs> and the patriarchy. Welcome. Yeah, you, yeah, you're a woman, so you don't need money because you have men for that. Yep. Yeah, I think we all have an idea of where this is going. Yeah. Is it another eight-month-long illness for each brother? No, but there there will be an illness. Mm. Wanting more money, not just the ability to be able to swan about with Jean-Baptiste without gaining her disapproving father's attention. Right. Marie hired Jean-Baptiste's faithful servant, Jean Hamoulin who went by the moniker of La Chouzy. I don't know why. I just want, I wanted his name to be Igor. <laughs> like just something so obviously like menacing. And <laughs> Dragula. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is his dedicated servant, Dragon. <laughs> totally, totally. Totally harmless. Normal. normal. Super normal. 100% whom she paid handsomely to slowly poison her brothers, just as she had her father. So he poisoned them? Yep. How did he do it? La Chouzy was able to lace their food with poison as a working member of her younger brother's staff. Oh, shit. And sure enough, her first brother passed away on June 17th, 1670, with the other passing three months later. Okay, so how soon was that from her dad dying and her getting the news that her inheritance was trash? So that would have been just under four years later. That's still a long game. It is a long game. I wonder if there was like a lot of preparation and convincing. Probably. Because especially if you're like higher up, the idea or threat of being poisoned is always a thing. Yep. Well, and with when I was reading the book, and when I say read, I mean I skimmed it. Yeah. It was 66 pages, and I don't have time for that. <laughs> Ew. More than Ew. 10? Trash. <laughs> Ew. It was so long. Ew. I did see in there that La Chouzy... He kind of started a little too strong by, like, giving some wine laced with this poison to one of the older brothers. Stop. But it had, like, the chalky stuff in it. No. And he, like, took a sip of it, and he's like, something is really wrong with this wine. And so he played it off, and he was like, oh, I'm so sorry. I must have given you gotten the, flour in it <laughs> i must have given you the glass that i had previously given to my friend who was taking some medicine nice and he's like nice i'm safe. so i'm so sorry so let me get you a new glass and i think it was after that that he was like food put it in the food yeah and like stir yeah don't just dump it on top like incorporate a, you goon not that we're trying to be like, this is how you successfully oh, yeah, get away with poisoning somebody. But uh someone. I didn't even realize. But like think things through. Right. Like if you're gonna try to get away with murder. Don't make it so obvious. Yeah. Yeah. Like who was it? Was it um Marianne Cotton? Didn't she like sprinkle arsenic on like a ham dish or something one night for her husband? 
And he was like, yeah. what's all this stuff? And she's like, don't worry about it. It's seasoning. <laughs> Just eat it. It's a new kind of salt. It's called spicy salt. It's called mouse booter. <laughs> oh, man. Unsurprisingly, traces of arsenic were discovered during their autopsies. What? But because Marie was in Paris at the time of their deaths... She couldn't she was... formally be charged as a suspect. Wow. Yep. That checks out. Following the deaths of her brothers, Marie's sister, Therese, who she had also attempted to poison. Yeah, why not? You know, fuck her. Yep. <laughs> had her food tested before she ate anything. Fun yeah, I fact, would too. Therese was, in fact, a Carmelite nun. She was a nun. Which is an order that lives in enclosed monasteries that rarely speaks, spending the bulk of their time in prayer and silence. Mm. So when she tested the food and it came back poisoned, she was like, what the fuck? And then she got kicked <laughs> out. <laughs> Unbeknownst to Marie, not everything was champagne and roses on the home front. Hmm. Her lover, Jean-Baptiste, hadn't received any financial benefits from her recent inheritances. Mm. So he decided to put together, let's just say, a contingency plan. Great. In fact, the pair had become estranged following the deaths of her brothers. More money, more money, more problems? What? <laughs> really? See... While Marie was busy killing the male members of her family for financial gain, Jean-Baptiste was keeping a detailed diary of her exploits. <laughs> okay. Along Dang. with the love letters she sent him, two promissory notes, one of which was for the sum of 30,000 lira from June 20th, 1670, dated just eight days after her father's death, and most damning of all, vials of the very poison that had been used to murder not only her father, but her two brothers. Nice. Yeah, because the guy who did it was his servant. Yep. She'd be like, hey, save those. This cache of evidence of her crimes was kept in a box with a note that read, quote, to be opened in the event of death prior to that, of Madame Dubron Villiers, end quote. Dang. And wouldn't you know it, Jean Baptiste did die suddenly on July 31st, 1672, but not by Marie's hands. Okay. It's commonly believed that he had been experimenting with poisonous gases and unfortunately died by inhaling the fumes after the glass mask he had been wearing to protect himself fell off. I'm sorry, that's really funny. I know. It's like, I'm going to try to kill people with gas and then dies of gas poison. <laughs> right. <laughs> Serves you right, you little cretin. Based on what I was able to find in the book from 1910, Jean-Baptiste would have been between 35 to 37 at the time of his death. That's so young. Yep. And unfortunately for Marie, his sudden death and lack of a will would soon mean her downfall. Yep. Unsurprisingly, Jean-Baptiste was still in debt. Mm -hmm. And as he had no heirs, his possessions were impounded so they could be assessed later for their value by his creditors and the local magistrates. It reminds me of like when somebody dies and they have a storage shed. Yeah. They do an auction of like, I want that weird baby carriage in the back of the storage shed. Or an estate sale. Yeah. Amongst his possessions was a small red leather casket inside which was all the damning evidence he'd gathered against Marie. Casket That's... in this sense, meaning box, like a small box. Okay. But like, honestly, I think it's kind of cool if it looks like a, like a little red coffin. Yeah. I was like, that's dope. Patent leather coffin. <laughs> that's dope. 
Let's make it super obvious that, like, she was a piece of trash. Yeah. The man she planted in her brother's home, La Chouzi, was arrested on March 4th, 1673, and he confessed everything while being tortured. Yeah, I bet. He was later sentenced to death by being broken on the wheel. Oh, <gasps> yeah. Oh, snap. Could, should should you tell people what that is, if or do you want, not want to? Google it yourself. It's really bad. Like all most deaths during that time were awful, but so yeah, that was bad, and that happened to him. On... Yeah, super, super not great. That happened to him on March twenty fourth. 1673 for his part in killing the Dubray men. Is do you think that's primarily because he was a servant killing nobles? Yes. Yeah. Like why it was so harsh? Yep. If you want to learn more about being broken on the wheel, uh I suggest you Google that. It's not good. <laughs> if you want to learn more about it, don't. <laughs> yeah, just don't. It's all bad. It's, it's all really bad. Meanwhile, Marie fled to England and then the Netherlands in hopes of avoiding extradition back to France. King Louis XIV, wanting to have the matter dealt with quickly, reached out to King Charles II in England to negotiate her extradition back to France. But by then, she had already fled to the Netherlands. Mm. They were cousins, I think. Marie and her maidservant hid at a convent in Liege, Belgium, until she was lured out in 1676 by a policeman named Francois de Grey, disguised as a priest. Clever girl. That would do it. Finally arrested, Marie was sent back to Paris, where she was put on trial on April 29th, 1676. Among her possessions during her arrest was, quote, a little casket of papers and letters of which she has the key and which has not yet been examined, end quote. I kind of hope it's the same red patent leather. <laughs> oh my God, they had matching. They had matching coffins. Aw, true love. Yeah. However, once it was opened, it was revealed that it contained a detailed confession of her crimes. Why? Because she was smart and wrote it all down. <laughs> Maybe it was the Catholic in her, like confessing her sins. Maybe. Marie's not too smart. Uh, apparently not. <laughs> While on trial, she confessed to attempting to murder her husband and daughter. Did she? I thought she had two sons. So, still shitty. Her husband and child. Mm-hmm. That's why I said I feel like one of them passed at infancy. Yeah, that would make sense. There's only mm-hmm. one left to kill. Mm-hmm. In addition to killing her father and brothers, when not in court, Marie attempted to complete suicide a number of times. At other times, she would hint that she could implicate a number of members of the nobility of France for also taking part in their own poisonous affairs. Of course she could. It was this list that King Louis XIV was so interested in getting his hands on prior to her being put to death. Like, no, 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 we're still going to kill you. But like, who's on that list? Just want to know if my BFF or like cousin is on the list. Yeah. Kind of important. As she awaited the final verdict, Ab Perot was appointed as her confessor. He was tasked with collecting the list of names of which he would only pass on after Marie had been put to death. Marie refused to rat out her associates, stating, quote, half the people of quality are involved in this sort of thing, and I could ruin them if I were to talk, end quote. Yeah. Do you think the king was cool with that? No. Nah. No, no, he was not. In fact, he was so not cool with it that he had her tortured for the information, but she refused to break. Dang. But how she was tortured is a little bit interesting. Okay. Was she, like, tickled? Marie was tortured using the water cure, where she was strapped down into a stretching rack, naked, and then forced to drink 16 pints or more than 9 liters of water. Her feet were secured by two rings, and her wrists were fastened above her head. With how she was placed, a trestle was under her back, so her body was bowed a little, and her head would have been at the same height as her feet. Okay. 
The following is an excerpt from the 1910 book about her that details what happened during this torture. Quote, On the small trestle, while she was being stretched, she said several times, My God, you are killing me, and I only spoke the truth. The water was given, she turned and twisted, saying, You are killing me. The water was again given. Admonished to name her accomplices, she said there were only one there was only one man who had asked her for poison to get rid of his wife, but he was dead. The water was given. She moved a little, but would not say anything. Admonished to say why, if she had no accomplice, she had written from the conciergerie to Penuti, begging him to do all he could for her and to remember that his interests in this matter were the same as her own. Mm -hmm. She said that she never knew Penuti, had had any understanding with Santa Claus about the poisons, and it would be a lie to say otherwise. But when a paper was found in Santa Claus' box that concerned Penuti, she remembered how often she had seen him at the house and thought it possible that the friendship might have included some business about the poisons. That being in doubt on the point, she risked writing a letter as though she were sure, for by doing so, she was not prejudicing her own case. Mm -hmm. For either Penuti was an accomplice of Santa Croix, or he was not. If he was, he would suppose the Marquis knew enough to accuse him, and would accordingly do his best to save her. If he was not, the letter was a letter wasted, and that was all. The water was again given, she turned and twisted much, but said that on this subject, she had said all she possibly could. If she said anything else, it would be untrue, end quote. Okay. Probably wasn't correct, but... Yeah. Once it became apparent that she would not share the names of her associates after five hours of torture... Oh my goodness. She was found guilty of her crimes and sentenced to death. And here is the sentence as it was written in the 1910 report. Mm. Quote, that by the finding of the court, Dubray du Bronvilliers is convicted of causing the death by poison of Maitre Dru Dubray, her father, and of the two Maitres Dubray, her brothers, one a civil lieutenant, the other a counselor to the parliament. Mm. Yep. Also of attempting the life of Therese Dubray, her sister. In punishment whereof the court has condemned and does condemn the said Dubray, Dubranvilliers, to make the rightful atonement before the great gate of the Church of Paris. They murdered her in front of pa- the church? Or is it no. just implying, like, killing you before you and like meet your maker? She has to confess before the church yeah. before. To make the rightful atonement before the great gate of the Church of Paris, whither she shall be conveyed in a tumbril, keep that in mind, barefoot, a rope on her neck, holding in her hands a burning torch, two pounds in weight, and there on her knees she shall say and declare that maliciously with desire for revenge and seeking their goods, she did poison her father, cause to be poisoned her two brothers, and attempt the life of her sister, whereof she doth repent, asking pardon of God, of the king, and of the judges, And when this is done, she shall be conveyed and carried in the same tumbril to the place de grave of this town, there to have her head cut off on a scaffold to be set up for the purpose at that place, afterwards her body to be burnt and the ashes scattered, and first she is to be subjected to the question ordinary and extraordinary, that she may reveal the names of her accomplices. Dang. She is declared to be deprived of all successions from her said father, brothers, and sister from the date of the several crimes, and all her goods are confiscated to the proper persons, and the sum of 4,000 liras shall be paid out of her estate to the king, and 400 liras to the church for prayers to be said on behalf of the poisoned persons, and all the costs shall be paid, including those of Amulan, called Le Chousy, end quote. So not only does she have to pay the king and the church, but she also has to pay the costs associated with La Chousy. Mm-hmm. Damn. Well, I mean, at this point, does it matter? They're just trying to get her money. Yeah. Yeah. Who else is going to get it? Yeah. Marie was transported to the site of her execution in a tumbrel or a dung cart. Ew. 
dressed in nothing but a shirt and a hood as she climbed the scaffold with dignity and courage before a huge crowd of onlookers on July 17, 1676, in what is now Place du L'Hôtel du Vie. Marie was beheaded before her remains were thrown onto a pyre, burnt, and after that, whatever remained was thrown into the Seine. Cute. Marie was 46 at the time of her death. So, like, relatively old Mm -hmm. during that time. Mm -hmm. And her execution would kind of start the ball rolling on the event known as the Affair of the Poisons. Mm. So nobody learned her lesson. So the Affair of the Poisons is kind of like when a bunch of people in the French court were going around, like, poisoning each other. And King Louis was trying to get the list of those people before they could start poisoning people in the court. Yeah. So. I get whoopsie. That. Yeah. That was a story of Madame du Well, that was terrible. Yeah. <laughs> she was nice. She's pretty great. Nice lady. Our next partner has a product I use literally every day. I started taking AG1 because I've often struggled with gut health and proper nutrition, which made me wonder what sort of vitamins and minerals I may be missing that my body really needs. With one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens to help you start your day right. This special blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focused, and aging. All the things. I drink my AG1 right away in the morning as a great way to get my day started. As someone who suffers from food allergies, I appreciate the fact that it's so lifestyle friendly, whether you eat keto, paleo, vegan, dairy-free, or gluten-free. Not only that, but the subscription comes with a year's supply of vitamin D, which is so important, especially in Minnesota where I'm from, where we don't get as much sunlight. For less than $3 a day, you can invest in your health, That's cheaper than a daily coffee habit. If you don't want to take my word for it, check out the over 7,000 five-star reviews that Athletic Greens has received. It's not just about the fact that I'm taking better care of my body. Athletic Greens is a climate-neutral certified company that gives back as well. For every purchase they receive, they donate to organizations that help supply nutritious foods to children in need, including No Kid Hungry, Right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition. It's just one scoop in a cup of water every day. That's it. No need for a million different pills and supplements to look out for your health. To make it easy, Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com emerging. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash E-M-E-R-G-I-N-G to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. Autumn's Oddities is a strange and unusual podcast made by the strange and unusual me, Autumn Groovy. Each week, I'll be taking you through some of the creepiest cases true crime has to offer. It won't only be true crime. I'll also be covering cryptids, haunted places, haunted things, and the true stories that inspired horror movies. Listen every Monday and Friday for new episodes. And remember, if it's creepy and weird, you'll find it here.
And this week's podcast plug is the Autumn's Oddities podcast from the Darkcast Network, hosted by our friend Autumn. She discusses strange and unusual true crime cases that end up running between 30 and 40 minutes on average. So it's really easy to binge her entire back catalog, which I encourage you to do. Nice. If you like listening to quick cases with a healthy dose of snark, Autumn's Oddities is worth a listen. Sounds great. And this week's listener question comes from John from the Dumbfound Dead and Reddit on Wiki podcasts. Hi, John. Hi, John. And he wants to know, who would be a formidable final boss in a video game out of all the people you've covered? Uh, I don't know. The pig that ate baby's faces was a pretty intense one. I don't know. Like, if it was a video game, you'd think it would be more like brute strength murdering than like poisoning. Yeah. You have to not, you have to get rid of their HP. Yeah. Who do you think? I'm trying to think of somebody who is very strong. Why am I blanking on his name? Swift Runner. Ooh, yeah. No, he'd be a great final boss. For those who are unfamiliar with who Swift Runner is, he was um, an indigenous people's person who committed cannibalism on his family. He's often associated with the legend of the Wendigo. Mm -hmm. Wendigo. Wendigo. There's a bunch of different ways to say it, but... Sorry. No, that's fine. But he was a large man. He was like almost seven feet tall. I think the idea of going up against him, knowing that he's going to eat you... Yeah. Would be terrifying. Yep. I'm actually looking at our catalog to see if there's anybody else. So that's mine. The big bad cannibal. Yeah. Who's the other major cannibal? Alfred Packer. Yeah. He'd be good because I feel like you would... He might not have a lot of like moves at first, but then he like really gets you. He's directionally challenged. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Or another good one. If we're looking at brute strength, the um, the big feet. The Bigfoot yeah. War? Yeah. If you would go against them, fuck that. Yeah, hell no. thanks. No. <laughs> hell no. Yeah, like just a bunch of them. Yeah, considering that one just Handful like of ripped them? the guy's head off. Yeah, that wins. Actually, no, I'm going to stop looking. That wins. <laughs> 100%. <laughs> the Bigfoot and uh, Swift Runner. Yeah. Done. Done. <laughs> <laughs> Done and damn. <laughs> <laughs> Done and no thank you. Yeah. All right. On that note, what's something good you'd like to share? Uh, Something good I would like to share is while we have been uh, now recording our normal stuff, I got engaged. (laughs) Yay! I'm going to get married. Oh, you got the ring? This is grandma's ring. Mine comes in another two weeks, I think. Okay. We're making it. It's being made and I'm like really excited to see the final product because we designed it together and I asked to not be alerted when it's ready and to have him be alerted when it's ready sure so that he can pick it up and it be a surprise that way nice because in my like goldfish brain I already kind of forgot what it's gonna look like (laughs) so it'll be exciting again (laughs) that's fair you know how it is I do you know how it is I'm oh, just like, wait, what? So yeah, so excited. I'm, I'm gonna get married next May. So happy for you. Thank you. We're gonna get married in a forest. So it'll be kind of like how it is now, where it's like yeah. starting to bud. Mm-hmm. Okay. Hopefully things will be a little green, a greener at that point. But if not, that's okay. I'll do my best to not get a sinus infection before your wedding. I know. Me too. <laughs> That and, like, my fiancé gets, like, walking pneumonia during this time. So we'll be boosting vitamin C. There you go. And elderberry for a month before. Yep. So, yeah. It was, it's really kind of funny. So he's Norse pagan, and we're trying to figure out how to incorporate his beliefs and practices into the wedding. But 
he was like, what do you want for food? And I was like, tacos. <laughs> <laughs> and he was like, that's not a Norse meal. And I was like, but tacos. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll see. Maybe I can get him. Maybe I can convince him to do like fry bread tacos or something. There you go. Those are delicious. Have you ever had a fry bread taco? Yes. Oh, They're good. Man. They're worth it. They're worth any stains on a wedding dress. I can tell you that much. Just get like, because his big thing is meat. Just make sure you have like carnitas and right barbacoa and well, like we can we can do barbecue stuff. Let's just have like tacos as an option for the buffet. <laughs> He's gonna be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> he sometimes listens to the podcast. I can hear him already yelling at me in the car. No, we're not no, gonna do it, that. It needs to be like hearty, like a hearty Norse meal. Like, you can have like a taco bar option. Why people taco not? <laughs> <laughs> That's what we're gonna call it. Yeah, maybe maybe during like the after hours of the reception, we can have tacos. Like not for like the meal, but like snacks while you're dancing. All right, what about you? What's something um, good. My intern started this past week <gasps> so nice has it so far so good so far so good super helpful she's very excited and i'm really glad that i didn't scare off both of our interns during their like welcome to the office lunch because they were t- we were talking about charlie the snake and i think i traumatized tiffany's oh, intern no. when i was talking about feedings sorry Shreya. yeah yeah. Not everybody's ready for that, Lindsay. No. <laughs> they asked. And then she was like horrified the whole time. So I'm sorry, Shreya. But Iris is really cool. And when Christine brought up the podcast, they were like, you have a podcast? And I was like, yeah, I have a podcast. So I don't know if they listen to it or not. But hi, Iris and Shreya. You guys are pretty cool. Oh, nice. Shout out. Shout out. With zero geolocation. So. Mm-hmm. Shall we shut her down? Let's. And go hang out outside? I'm having a hard time breathing. It's so nice outside. On that note, <laughs> you can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're also on Twitter at yieldcrimepod and on Facebook and Instagram at yieldcrimepodcast. We're also on YouTube. You should subscribe. We also have a P.O. box where you can send us letters. You know, those old fancy old things you can get in the mail. It's trampoline season, y'all. So if any of you want to uh, mail a trampoline for hashtag Teen Trampoline, this will never die. (laughs) It will. This is year two of Team Trampoline. Could you imagine a trampoline at my wedding? Because I can, and (laughs) Mike is going to be upset about it. (laughs) Tacos and trampolines. Oh my god, it's all coming together. (laughs) It's all coming. Together, somebody send me one. <laughs> if you want to do that, you can do so to Yield Crime, P.O. Box 341, Wyoming, Minnesota 55092. You can also email oh, us at yieldcrimepodcast at gmail.com. Submit your listener questions, story ideas, all that other fun stuff. A great way to support the show if you'd like to help us out, but can't do so financially. Totally cool. Would we'll be Absolutely to leave us. Fine. A five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, Good Pods, or to leave us a rating on Spotify. And this week's review comes from Cicely M. on Apple Podcasts. And they say, so much fun. Five stars. I love this podcast a great deal. These two are hilarious and so much fun to listen to. The stories are well-researched and they're really fascinating at that. It's a really neat and fun way to learn about crimes and other things that happened before 1900. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you would like to support us financially, you can do so over at Buy Me a Coffee for a one-time donation. You can also join our Patreon for as low as a dollar a month to get early ad-free access to all of our content. And if you want to rep some of our merch, we're not going to say no. Head on over to our Tee Public. Yeah, Tee Public. Yeah. That's the only one. <laughs> and get yourself some, some sweet swag. It's the only one. And on that note, as always, I'm Lindsay. 
And I'm Madison. And we'll see you next time with another tale as old as crime. <laughs>